Hello and welcome to our presentation on InnerSource, a step on the path to becoming an open source organization. We're delighted to be here with you today at the Open Source Summit in Japan. Um, my name is Claire Dillon. I'm the Executive Director of InnerSource Commons. I'm also the co-founder of Open Ireland Network and an organizer of the OSPO++ Network. And hi everyone, this is Daniel Izquierdo. I'm one of the founders and CEO of Viterdia. We're a small startup in Spain focused on providing analytics and open source and inner source projects, as well as providing OSPO and ISPO services. I'm board member at the Inner Source Commons Foundation, and I'm, I'm, I'm part of the governing board at the Chaos Community that stands for Community Health Analytics for Open Source Software. And we're here today to talk about how inner source as a practice can help people on a path to open source culture change. Because working in the open is a challenge. It requires total transparency, and there are often reputational risks associated when organizations are trying to move from a more traditional way of developing software to move into developing software in the open. There are cultural expectations in terms of engaging with open source communities, and Teams often want to learn how to do that in a safe environment. And this is what InnerSource gives you. InnerSource is the practice of using open source methods and practices, but within an organization's organizational boundaries. So they can do that in a safe environment and get you ready to then contribute to the open source community. So let's start by understanding a little bit more about what InnerSource is. Okay, so this is the short definition. Claire already mentioned this, right? So let's let's say this again. Inner source takes the lessons learned from developing open source software and applies them to the way companies develop software internally. So this is about developing proprietary software. This is not about creating open source software. You have more information at the innersourcecommons.org. And why inner source? So uh, inner source aims at removing silos of development. If we use an analogy here of how large corporations are. If we think about business units, department, geographical regions, all of them look like this. So there are silos of development. There are silos of knowledge. So probably you face the problem in your, in your company where you are developing or you realize that other departments are doing a similar piece of code. It doesn't matter the code itself. It, it matters that you are producing once and again the same or pretty similar piece of software. So what if we are able to remove all of these silos, right? So next slide. So if, we're, if we are able to remove all of these silos, then we can think of uh, a much more engaged way of developing software altogether from different areas of the company. If we think about this, what we'll see is that the more the, the points of, of, of the, the different point of view when attacking a problem, the higher the innovation within this, this organization, the more eyes looking at the source code, if this is totally transparent, if this is totally collaborative, um, the higher the quality of the software, probably the higher the time to market because you are creating um, more stable pieces of software. You go about specific uh, code review processes, about the pull request process. We'll see about it uh, later. And what we've seen at the Inner Source Commons and in other corporations is that, that there is a higher engagement from employees. From the employee perspective, uh, what we are doing here is we are empowering developers. So we are empowering developers to make decisions, to solve problems. They, they are engineers, right? And because they are engineers, they like sol solving problems. Um, by opening this door, what we are doing again is we are allowing innovation. So we are we are giving room to developers, to, to middle managers, to everyone in the corporation to try things, to try and fail. And that's really important, this, this failing thing, because this is where we all learn about. So what we are doing in reality is we are creating these, let's say, more dynamic environments. And, and at the very end, what we are creating is we are speeding up developers into uh, soft skills, soft and hard skills at the same time, because we are allowing developers to talk to each other. If you remember about the silos that we saw before the photo, uh, what happens in, in the usual hierarchy in, in large corporations is if there is an issue between one developer, the development team and the other, this needs to be escalated. So this needs to, to go through the, you know, the hierarchy, what we call at the inner source commons, the cheese interface. But what if we break all of this? So we are allowing developers to work to each other. So we need to uh, set up specific rules, clear rules, development rules, as those rules you can see in the open, as in open source. So we are bringing those lessons learned again into 
uh, into the proprietary software that we are producing. So next slide. Good. Um, and all of this, uh, all of this discourse is not based on, on just the specific steps or random ones. So this is based on, on, on principles. These ones are, are it's, it's a way of looking at them. This is based on the Apache way by the Apache Software Foundation, which is what, what we are using at the Inner Source Commons as, you know, a way of getting inspired. Um, if we want to make this cultural change, because this is mainly about a cultural change, we are, we are moving into from scenarios where we are hiding things and we have certain power into scenarios where we are sharing, we are totally transparent, right? Remember that we want to move into this open way or open by default, open way of, of, of producing software at, at the very end in our journey to open source, we, we, are, we need to, to, to change our minds into this way. So these principles that we can see here, communication, transparency, collaboration, community and meritocracy are, are part of this journey. Um, let's think for a while in how open source communities work and, and how we are applying this internally. So if we think about communication, what if we start having all of the communications open, all of the discussions, technical, technical discussions specifically open. So what we are creating is certain, certain layer of transparency, right? And we all have an opinion. And if we allow having opinions in, in the company, what we are creating is certain collaboration because someone will communicate certain technical decisions. And because this is transparent, then others may bring their own point of view. Bringing other point of view, what we are bringing here is innovation, remember? And then at the same time, we are creating certain concept of community. So we are allowing people across the different silos in the photo that we saw before about, you know, bringing together and having a technical discussion all together. And then, of course, we may see in the near future certain meritocracy as technical leaders or people with, um, with certain skills that will, will raise their voice. They might be uh, you know, um, reference as those technical leaders within the community, internally in the corporation. So this is, this is what we can call meritocracy. So, okay. Um, so let's, let's try to go back again to the definition of inner source. So what is inner source? So this is a longer definition, right? So we, we've learned a bit about the principles. We've learned about the reasons why inner source and how uh, large corporations behave nowadays. So going through, uh, through all of them, basically, uh, we want to use those open source principles and practices uh, to produce a proprietary software. And this is done through empowering individual engineers uh, to contribute code. This is done focused on, on cultural approach, process approach, and tooling then. We'll see, uh, we'll see more details later. But the idea is to be able to, to enable people to uh, produce software if they are interested for any reason. So basically low the barriers to contribution to other projects that are not perhaps part of their business unit. And then this is done through a certain process. This is done through specifically a pull request, which is a GitHub terminology, let's say. There are uh, merge requests if we, if we focused on, on GitLab, for instance. But the idea is that we allow different business units, people coming, coming from different silos to contribute to other silos. So for this, of course, we need to have clear rules, explicit processes, and, and, and et cetera. The idea is that we are kind of democratizing uh, development and control over the direction of the project by, you know, pushing developers, encouraging pull requests over, over feature requests. So this is the longer definition of inner source. And now we'll have a little talk about what are the inner source benefits, because we've talked already about how inner source can be a step on the path to open source. And certainly the founders of inner source commons or for the founders of inner source commons, this was one of the primary motivations for when they started looking at inner source. So there are great documented case studies from PayPal where some of our founders um, came from where, where they were looking at how do you actually, you know, get that culture change happening within an, inside an organization to be ready to actually do open source collaborations outside the organization. Some of our, the folks in Inner Source Commons have actually taken this to another step, whereby, for example, in Comcast, they have an open source program office, which is also responsible for the rollout of their Inner Source programs. And Comcast have actually decided that for any organizations who want to open source their project, they have to go to 
through a step of inner sourcing it first so that they can prove that they can do the necessary community management and to generate the community around their project so that when they actually bring that to the open, they know they have the skills required to actually make that successful in the open. So this idea of inner source being a path, a step on the path to open source is a very well documented one. But it's not the only reason why people are actually turning to inner source, because we're seeing that many organizations are turning to inner source just to increase the efficiency and code reuse, um, often on a step of their own digital transformation. There's a great presentation by Matt Cobby from National Australia Bank, where he has shared with us on one of our community calls exactly how that's happening in National Australia Bank. And many organizations are actually doing that in order to make that code re reuse happen across the various different silos. So that instead of, as Daniel described before, instead of having multiple implementations of the same project or process across all those silos, you could have one and all those silos would be contributing into that one instance of a commonly used piece of technology. And indeed, there's actually evidence out there to suggest that inner source or the use of open source methods and practices can increase developer productivity. So not just in terms of the idea of reusing code, that in itself is an efficiency and an increase in productivity, but actually the practices of open source can increase productivity. And we learned about this McKinsey uh, report through a Microsoft blog where Scott Guthrie pointed folks to this report, where it talked about this idea of open source culture and methods and practices proving or being closely correlated with increased developer velocity and productivity. And we have seen that this actually does work in terms of breaking down silos. This is a great graphic which comes from Bosch. And what they did was they tracked how many contributions were being made from one business unit into another business unit's code. And when they showed this to management, this deep mesh of collaboration where all the business units were collaborating across the organization into different business units code, it demonstrated to them the real return on investment for inner source for the company, because it actually showed how you could actually generate innovation and how you could unlock innovation between business units using processes like inner source. And there is more more to learn from folks like Tencent, who again shared in one of our summits how they use this cross-departmental um, collaboration to unlock innovation within their organization. And indeed, we've seen a lot of organizations come to InnerSource or start experimenting with InnerSource when they are being mandated to do cross-departmental projects. So for example, DevOps can often involve working with teams across a number of different business units. When you're implementing something like DevOps, people have turned to InnerSource to do that in a way that involves and democratizes that process across those business units. So we're seeing a lot of people come to InnerSource Commons and try InnerSource for the first time when they've been embarking on projects like DevOps or any other kind of cross-departmental platforms that people might be trying to uh, implement. A great example of this is Capital One, whose journey to inner source started in this DevOps arena and has grown and scaled from there quite significantly. Definitely recommend you check out um, this presentation from the Finos organization where Capital One described their journey. The link is in the slides. But it's not only that, because we see that a lot of folks are actually turning to inner source because it's simply a way in which developers are happier developing. And particularly for the younger generation, where people are much more used to having agency and developing in that open way, inner source can definitely appeal to them much more than more traditional development processes that, that organizations have had in the past. So it can definitely help with your people strategy and skills building. And it's not just about recruiting folks from the outside into your organization. It's about keeping them happier when they're there, when you people have collaborations across team. And we're also seeing it where organizations are thinking about career path development within organizations. So that instead of people looking over across the development silos and saying, I'd love to work over there, this way they can actually start doing that before they actually um, uh, leave their jobs and they can get experience in different organizations code so that they can demonstrate the value that they could bring to that department even before they move jobs. So folks are using that in that way. 
Or as for example, in Morgan Stanley, um, where Elspeth shared with us at the last summit at Source Commons, that Morgan Stanley have been using Source to actually build up experiences, build up experience, cross-departmental experience in their legacy code and helping revitalize that code for use in the future. So it can also be done to future-proof your development teams and older projects against uh, making sure that there's enough folk who knows what's going on in that project to actually sustain that development. So as you can see, there are loads of benefits that people can have from using inner source. So let's have a look now, and Danny will take through the steps that people take to get started with inner source and what kind of journey they go on. Thank you, Claire. So um, this, is, this is experience based on the inner source commons, part of the use cases that Claire uh, mentioned during the benefits uh, section. Um, and the idea is, well, this is all of this discussion about the inner source and how to become a, a good open source citizen is really good. Um, then you've discussed or we've discussed about this cultural approach, then we need to focus on process and then finally on tools, etc. But the question is, okay, where, where, where can I start at? Remember that we started the conversation today about, well, inner source is about doing open source, but in a controlled environment. So again, inner source is not open source, but inner source is about using those best practices from open source. So basically we are, you know, scaling up our, our managers and developers into this way of working in the open. So we can deal better, you know, with, with the risk associated and so on. Um, what we've seen at the inner source commons is that large corporations typically start with, with an experiment. So it's about trying things. Um, and, and the idea is, well, there are already cases within the corporation where we can see different departments or business units trying to do something together. And, and given the constraints of the, same, of, of the very same corporation, it happens that it's perhaps really hard uh, to, to access other business units code. Uh, then there, is, there are discussions around budget, et cetera, et cetera. But the thing is about, okay, let's try to create this bubble of inner source. Let's try to kickstart this experiment and then try to apply directly from scratch all of the principles of inner source. Remember, we are discussing, we are talking about transparency, collaboration, community, right? So we need to allow, to, to, to give room to make this happen. Um, then there are, we can think of two different approaches, top down or bottom up. Um, the thing is that if we go for the top-down approach, then we need like uh, heavy support from the chief level. Like they really believe that, that this is the right way of proceeding. And then you need like uh, specifically uh, financial support because th this way of working is about uh, bringing a specific people to deal with, you know, this concept of inner source, either uh, starting as an experiment or perhaps uh, starting like really big from, from scratch. The thing is that the usual way of proceeding that we've seen uh, initially more successful perhaps, or at least more often, is about uh, creating the grassroots uh, within the corporation. Um, and this movement, even when you need the, you know, air cover and ground cover to deal with inner source, uh, it's about developers trying to behave as developers. So this means you have to remove all of the bureaucracy, all of the hierarchy, all of the management, et cetera. And then it's about developers working with each other. Because remember that inner source is about empowering developers. Remember that, that open source is about letting developers to work in the open. So they, they need to know how to behave. They need to be you know, good open source citizens. And because of this, uh, the way we've seen you know, to, to, to create, to have this effort within the company is about growing the community from, from, the very do, from the very bottom. And then there are some good examples, as uh, Claire mentioned before, that we can go through them uh, later. Or you, can, you have the links to the, to the YouTube or, or the presentation. So please join us at the, at, at the discussions there. Um, okay, we started as experiment. We are kind of growing the community. There are developers interested in the in the in the discussion. There are ambassadors, what we call it them sometimes. We need to scale, right? So then this is the time where you need to have certain, let's say, inner source entity. You need to move into uh, how how okay this this has been successful as experiment. So how are we scaling to the rest of the organization? This is where we can bring this concept of ISPO, Inner Source Program Office, or OSPO, Open Source Program Office, depending if you are doing inner source or open source. Uh, but the thing is that 
you need this office to achieve, let's say, company-wide scale of inner source and open source. So we are seeing now later in the next slides about uh, this ISPO discussion and OSPO discussion. So Claire, all yours. Thank you, Daniel. So yes, now let's look at the idea of how do you scale inner source? So as Daniel mentioned, this can often be done through an organizational construct like either an open source program office or an inner source program office, which is a relatively new um, uh, term that's being used in industry. The, the idea of an open source program office is very, very well established. Um, and oftentimes inner source initiatives can be managed out of those open source program offices. So when we think about the path to open source, we can think about it as the kinds of topics that an open source program office might look at um, and the kind of topics that an inner source uh, initiative might look at. And oftentimes there, are, there is a quite a large overlap. So for example, in the areas of open source culture, in terms of how do you set up effective collaboration, in terms of the processes you use, the tools you use, how you communicate about what's happening and what the decision-making practices are, all of those types of behaviors and methods and processes are the um, responsibility of both the open source program office and an inner source program office or an inner source initiative. But there are also topics that are particular to both initiatives that may not have an overlap. So for example, in the open source community, there'd be a lot more emphasis on things like the compliance to open source uh, licenses, managing reputation, how do you actually collaborate even with, for example, the open source foundations, and for example, perhaps looking at competitive scenarios or competitors in the marketplace. So it's a lot more external focused. From an inner source perspective, people want to look at different types of license agreements, perhaps even license agreements between um, different business units to help establish correct and proper ways of working together. They want to be looking at things like how do you scale your teams internally. There may be some concerns about taxes if you're doing cross um, uh, national boundary collaborations. And you're basically looking at the effectiveness of those collaborations within your organization. So there are topics that are particular to inner source. So looking at that in a little bit more detail, we've listed here some of the common responsibilities of both an open source program office or an inner source program office or an inner source initiative within an open source program office um, and to look at the differences between them. So again, to go through that in just a little bit more detail, both are concerned with internal policies and processes but an inner source initiative is often more looking at the contributor agreement between teams and looking at how that can be managed looking at reward policies, how do you incentivize that kind of collaboration, those kind of processes, everything happens within the inner source initiative. They may also be responsible for the supporting infrastructure to support inner source. So for example, looking at uh, discoverability of projects across the organizational, perhaps developing an inner source portal, that's often a common first step for organizations looking at inner source, and also looking at the tools that the organization uses for collaboration and communication, and where and how that can be standardized across the organization. Sometimes it's not often across the entire organization, but different tools may be required for different requirements um, depending on the, uh, the needs of the business unit at hand. Both organizations, both the open source program office and the inner source program office are also looking at the measurements and the metrics required to track the success of both initiatives, but they may be different depending on the context <clears throat> and specifically, <clears throat> excuse me, depending on the actual priorities of the organization involved. Both are also involved in advocacy and communications. In particular, this is an incredibly important step on a path to inner source where you share the success stories, where you amplify communications, where you even look for opportunities for collaboration across business units so that you can ensure that that great um, benefit can actually extend beyond a given business unit across the organization. They're often involved in education and events. Again, from an inner source perspective, that's often a very important step in terms of helping people understand what exactly is happening, where are the opportunities for collaboration, and understanding um, the ways in which the, the organization's culture is evolving. And often the inner source program office or the folks responsible for inner source are also responsible for representation at external events because it's a very important um, part of an inner source's an inner source 
uh, initiative is often to share what's happening so that you can learn with other organizations that would be similar. So for example, um, presenting at an InterSource Commons event is something that an awful lot of folks that are in ISPOs often do so that they can share their own experiences and challenges and get feedback on, on learnings from other organizations. And lastly, the idea of managing relationships. For an OSPO, it's a pretty well established idea that, um, that the OSPO is responsible for managing relationships with, for example, open source foundations. In an inner source world, there may not be foundations to manage. Well, except, of course, inner source commons, because we'd love to have you over there. But you do want to think about how do you actually manage vendor relationships um, in the context of uh, inner source. So, for example, some of our the folks that work in the community are looking at how do you actually create agreements with vendors so that you can have them involved in an effective way within your inner source collaboration. So these are just some of the ways to think about how an inner source program office or an inner source initiative within an open source program office, what are the kinds of responsibilities and activities that they do on a day-to-day -day basis? So next, we'll actually have a look at, dig a little deeper on that idea of measuring success. So I'll hand you back to Daniel to talk about measuring success in DoraWai. Thank you, Claire. Um, so we've, we've learned about certain things, about the benefits, we've seen more or less the differences between OSPO and ISPO and et cetera. So the thing is, how do I know if we are moving into the right direction, right? If we are walking the right inner source path, even open source path and so on. So this is about this, this discussion. So measuring success. Um, next slide, please. Okay, so there are two questions here. First one, how, how can we measure this? Inner source success, open source success, moving into the OSPO, moving into, into, into the ISPO ecosystem. Um, and perhaps how are we making this process objective. So this is why we have metrics. This is why we'd like to move forward with, with metrics and, and be able in somehow to, you know, to, to analyze, to, to understand, to measure our, our inner source readiness or open source readiness. So for this, it's like about wearing, you know, uh, inner source or open source special glasses. And then we look at our organization. So are you working in a collaborative way? Are you working in a transparent way? Are you having communication across silos or business units? So this is about this. Next slide, please. Thank you. So the question probably I have for all of you is, um, what is the most important metric for you? Um, probably as many people we are in this talk, uh, between speakers and attendees, um, we'll, we'll, we'll put on the table those number of metrics because depending on, on our expertise, experience and so on, probably our, our way of measuring success is different. So for a developer, maybe this is about, um, you know, functionality or quality of the, of the product or, or engagement with other, with other peers. But maybe from a marketing perspective, it's about uh, creating an inner source ecosystem or so. Maybe from a chief development, it's about um, discussing uh, return of investment and so on. So there are different, different roles will bring different metrics. So in reality, the, the, the discussion is not that much about metrics themselves. We'll see some examples later, but it's about the business goals or the cultural goals that you are trying to achieve when moving into the open when or when moving into the inner sources in between a step. So we can think of, <clears throat> excuse me, different, different goals. So are you interested in producing code? Are you interested in bringing innovation, productivity, time to market, effectiveness? So there are, there are different business goals that we can think of. Um, uh, the idea or perhaps the two main points or the key discussions we should have before even talking about metrics is about the methodology that you are following and the strategy that we are putting on the table. So then we can structure all of the metrics needs that we have. So then we can properly advance and everyone can follow the same path. So next slide, please. Um, the first of them is probably about the methodology. Um, for this, uh, um, one of the proposals or experiences that we've seen once and again is the goal question metric approach. Um, probably this sounds familiar for, for those that are uh, building hardware or goods, but in, in the case of software, um, this, is, this is about using a similar approach. So if, if our goal, or, or better said, if the first thing or the first step is about understanding the business goals. So the previous slide, what we discussed, right? So what, what are we trying to achieve? Maybe reusing code or um, having a higher engage from developers or so. And then based on this goal, what we are doing is we are 
we are dividing this into different questions. So we are, let's say, using this approach of divide and conquer, where uh, for a given goal, we are splitting this into different questions, and then it's much easier, let's say, to reach out to the metrics. If we start from the metrics, we've seen certain uh, pitfalls, let's say, about, okay, we have these metrics and these are the important metrics, but what happens in reality is that these are the metrics that you are gathering because you can, because you are able from a technical perspective. And then you are kind of forcing, you know, the use of those metrics into how you are uh, defining the goals for your organization. So that's why it's so important to start from the goal perspective. And then you'll define a set of metrics probably. And perhaps you are not even able to gather some of them. And that's totally okay. But the thing is that you have those metrics specified. And, and at least with respect to the others, you are choosing, you are having the right ones. Of course, this is an iterative process. So <clears throat> whatever you are defining as business goal or cultural goals for, for this year, maybe for 2022 or for 2023, uh, those will be different in the following year. So in the same way that business goals evolve, questions and metrics will evolve probably. So next slide. Um, and how, how do we bring all of these slides into the daily decision process. So probably you are following certain uh, strategy on how you are uh, defining, uh, you know, process or so. If we think about automotive industry, maybe you are following the kata improvement cycle, for instance. So the thing is about how are you embedding uh, the metrics discussion into those. Kata definitely works with metrics as well, but in this case it's about, you know, this might be another way of looking at this strategy, but, which is basically, well, first, define the policies and plan those policies and specifically have a, a section on how you are measuring success within those policies. Maybe you are trying to foster, I don't know, new contributions from newcomers from other business units. That's good. So how are you measuring success here? Maybe about the number of newcomers producing a first commit in other business units that are not theirs. So you have the policy and then you have how you are measuring success here. So in reality, what we have here again is an iterative process where you have the plan and the policies, you are you know, doing them, putting those in place, and then you are checking if those are actually working because you, you, you have metrics now, right? So you can check if, if those are uh, according to your expectations. If they are according to your expectations, you are acting accordingly. If they are not working under expectations, then probably you are in any case acting accordingly. So defining or tuning a bit the, the plan and the policies. So this is about remember strategy and method. So next slide, please. Um, and let's go with some sample metrics. Um, I choose like this two business goals, code review, and then activity characterization. So basically the business goals that we can see here are, well, we are interested in creating more uh, reliable artifacts or improve the knowledge sharing, right? Or maybe we'd like to have a more homogeneous way of working across the organization or even go faster to market. So those are part of the code review process that we'll see some examples later, but these four scenarios are well specific business goals that we can discuss about. On the right, what we can see is specific business goals related to the activity characterization. So uh, again, we might be interested in, 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 in understanding uh, how we are creating, um, you know, more reliable and artifacts if, if, if people are collaborating. So as you can see, we have exactly the same text here, but what happens is depending if we are using the code review approach or the activity characterization approach, the metrics will be different and we'll see later some examples here. So that's why we, we wanted to have this on purpose. And well, maybe we are interested in understanding to having certain engineering teams visibility or maybe bottlenecks that are happening here or there because we'd like to move the resources into those areas to improve. So let's go to the next slide. Um, let's start with the, with the first one, maybe with this concept of activity characterization. So let's focus now on the chart. The chart, each of the pink dots are developers. Um, and then you can see that those are around, you know, kind of creating a stars, right? Or circles. So each of them are projects. This is the analysis of the CNCF ecosystem. And uh, each of the dots are developers. And then there is an edge, a link between the developer and the center of, of one of those stars. If that developer contributed at least one commit, okay? So then basically we can see on the left, the big one, which is Kubernetes. And then at the bottom, we can see that there we have OpenShift, which is a distribution of Kubernetes. And then we have some other projects here and there. 
of course, if there is a developer that have participated in more than one project, basically in two, then we start seeing this this uh, analysis for in this uh, uh, this uh, group of developers, for instance, between Kubernetes and OpenShift on the bottom left on the chart. And this means that those developers that are between both groups are developers participating in Kubernetes and OpenShift on the same uh, at the same time. So this is collaboration again. Some of the questions, if we move to the left, uh, some of the questions that we can think of is, well, we have all of these people collaborating in, in my organization. Remember, this might be open source or internal collaboration. So the question I have is, where are my teams contributing at? Or how are my business units collaborating? Or, or even what is the expertise of my team? So do we have developers participating in, in certain technologies as Kubernetes, other technologies, internal technologies? Maybe even you can go to the programming language. So how many developers do we have that are experts in JavaScript or in certain frameworks or maybe in Python or Java? I don't know. So there are, there are different ways of looking and producing this kind of charts. What we can get here from here is about how people are collaborating across business units. So basically, we are breaking silos. Let's think for a moment how this, how would this uh, chart look like if we start from scratch working in a silo way. So basically each of the starts we will be or would be absolutely isolated. So we would have silo A, silo B, silo C, silo D, and there wouldn't be any kind of collaboration there. By the way, if you are interested in understanding a bit more about these charts and or the analysis that we run, you have here on the, on the right uh, specific links to the, to the IEEE software paper. So next slide, please. Um, and all of this mess that we can see here in the middle is, is collaboration. So this is the beauty of open source. This is probably what each large organization would like to be, would like to look like after several months or years of iteration into the inner source journey. So it's about breaking the silos of development and it's about allowing developers to collaborate in different projects across different business units producing basically innovation and failing at the same time. So this is it, this is collaboration. So next slide. Uh, some other examples, and this is specifically about uh, code review activity. Um, we may have other questions, for, for instance, uh, now we are working in a, in a, in a new way. Are we, are we uh, you know, uh, going faster to market? Because remember, some of the benefits is about higher engagement of developers, being faster in the development process, producing more stable uh, pieces of code, uh, you know, final artifacts and so on. The question is, are we improving? So from a code review perspective, um, we, we may have different questions. So if we are improving in this efficiency, how fast are we attending code reviews, maybe for those coming from different business units, the resolution time, or even the code review fairness across different teams. Because don't forget that each of the different teams, they have different uh, you know, priorities. So now what we are doing is we have kind of a fight of priorities here. And then there are, there are different charts that we can look at. For instance, at the bottom, you can see like a summary of those. So we can think of different KPIs. So the more merge requests, probably the better. This is like a pull request. In this case, this is, these are examples coming di directly from, uh, from GitLab analysis, which is uh, well, the open source analysis of GitLab in this case. Then there are certain number of submitters, reviewer. You can have uh, certain indicators as the median time open days that are Remember, we are following this goal question metric approach. So in this case, we would have this goal of, uh, you know, we need to improve efficiency. Okay, so then we may split this into these four questions that then we have. And then finally, we have the metrics. And then the metrics are different ways of looking at this. By the way, this analysis is based on, you know, we are using the, uh, the tools of Remark Lab, which is part of the chaos community. Um, this is all open source, just in case you are interested in, in learning about them, as you can see here on, on the right. Um, yep, yeah, next slide, please. Um, more details about Grimoire Lab in case you, you, you'd like to, to try it. Uh, so this is on the top, you have uh, the architecture where you are ingesting data sources. Basically, you are transforming the data in somehow. And then on the right part, uh, you are uh, browsing that data. So you can, you can use, let's say, Grimoire Lab as a black box in somehow. Um, and all of the charts that we, we saw here were, were gathered using Viteria Analytics in Mark Lab. So there are some, some links on the, on the bottom right in case you are, you are interested. So next slide. Um, yeah, and now we go into the summary and next steps. Um, so what we've covered today, uh, just as a quick summary. First, 
we've had a quick introduction about well how inner source can be this step on the path to open source culture we see that there are certain intersections but those are not exactly the same right so then we went into uh, the definition of inner source the short definition and the longer definition the benefits of inner source uh, different ways of adopting inner source you know top down approach bottom up uh, or or at the same time this discussion about the scale inner source through the ispo or ospo so the open source for an office or the inner source for an office and then we've discussed at the very end about measuring inner source success. Next slide. So uh, remember that you are not alone. Uh, now Claire will discuss a bit more about the inner source common. So how uh, you know you can be part of the community and learn about how to move into the open through an inner source initiative. Because no one is alone in this journey and we're all learning more about this every step of the way. Um, so now I'll give a brief introduction to Inner Source Commons. Uh, as Daniel mentioned, it's the community for Inner Source practi Practitioners. It's the largest community worldwide. Um, and we would love if you could come along and uh, join us uh, in the community uh, to help grow the community. At a glance, right now, we have over 1,300 individuals uh, who've been involved with over 500 organizations who have been involved in InterSource Commons um, on their journey. It is a, um, a place, a safe place to come and share your questions and challenges. Uh, we operate a lot under Chatham House rules, which means that folks can come along without um, any fear of, of their uh, uh, identity, their name, their organization's name being shared beyond the, the community. So people find it a safe space to come along and collaborate around inner source. Uh, we have over representatives from over 40 countries who um, are involved in the inner source commons and um, who participate in our events and activities. And we keep a track of those organizations who are speaking publicly about their inner source journeys. So we have nearly 100 now organizations who have uh, spoken publicly either at inner source commons or um, in their own blogs or events about their inner source journey. Um, and we keep a track of those so that we can help other people learn from the community in terms of uh, folks that have gone before. So what is uh, the Inner Source Commons? What kinds of activities do they actually participate in? Well, we have three primary working groups that we organize our activity around. The first is the Learning Path Working Group, which is responsible for creating training videos and articles to explain and teach the various aspects of Inner Source. Um, that content is also being translated by our community into many different languages worldwide, so we encourage you to, to, um, to check that out. We also have a Patterns Working Group, uh, which is about curating the best patterns and practices um, and also anti-patterns from our our contributing community and um, to help kickstart and scale your inner source practice. So that's about gathering the learnings that emerge from our discussions so that we can actually put them down so other folks can have actually see what kind of things might they want may, they may want to experiment within their organizations. And lastly and most recently we now have a marketing and outreach working group which is about um, organizing our conferences and events um, but also raising inner awareness about inner source externally. So uh, we help to match uh, speakers to conferences and things like that as well. So if you are interested in participating in any of these working groups, we would love to hear from you. But there are many ways to actually uh, be part of the inner source commons community. The first is just to learn from our resources. We, we are grateful for each and every follow, like, share, subscribe um, on any of our assets uh, on YouTube, on our website, on LinkedIn, on Twitter. So please do come and learn from uh, the community itself. That's it. That's a, that's a great thing to do. But if you would like to join in the conversation and actually share some of your challenges and get some feedback and, and insights, come along and join us on the Inner Source Commons Slack, which is where a lot of our activity happens. And even better, sign up for our virtual Coffee Buddies Slack channel, where you actually get to meet one on one with, with uh, another member of the community um, who will be able to share with you uh, their journey. We, we find that those kind of one to one conversations are sometimes the best place to learn about, uh, about inner source and inner source comments. And then if you have some time to actually contribute back to the community, we would love it if you could contribute to one of our working groups. There are many easy ways to onboard um, into each of the working groups, um, and we would love to see you there. So there are three ways that you could participate in Inner Source Commons. Um, but to find out more, we would love you to come along and visit the community. You can meet myself and Daniel and many other lovely people there who are willing to help you on your journey to Inner Source.
Daniel, any final words? I would like to, I would love to see you all at the Inner Source Commons. So you can find us in Slack or, or uh, you know, on Twitter and so on. So feel free to reach to us and we would be, we'll be very happy to drive you around the Inner Source Commons and show you about, you know, the community and how to get engaged. So it would be great to see you around. And now I think we'll be open for Q&A. So we'd be delighted to field your questions. So looking forward to talking to you shortly.